Hi everyone, uh, just a short video today. I wanted to talk about lane following assist and autonomy features. Uh, basically, while looking at the Dutch configurator, uh, I noticed when I was going through the detail that I'd uh, misread lane following assist as lane keep assist. Um, they're very, very similar, and I guess the actual features themselves are very, very similar. But Hyundai are labeling them as two pieces of technology. Lane Keep Assist, which is available on most of the models for the countries that are getting multiple models, and Lane Following Assist, which is on the premium only, on the top end only. So what are the differences between the two? Well, I don't want to get into too technical detail because I honestly don't know. I haven't read the manuals. I don't know exactly how it works. But from the pictures that I'll start uh, showing up here um, and the reviews that I've read so far, if I try and simplify it, Lane Keep Assist basically bounces you between the two lines. So you've got your central line um, on the road and you've got your inside line denoting the edge of the road. And if you're driving and you veer towards one side and the wheel comes across the white line, the car will automatically correct and bring you back. And if you veer towards the middle of the road and your wheel's going to cross the white line, it will bring you back again. So. I interpret that as it bounces you between the two white lines and keeps you in the lane. Which, if you exaggerated that and you, you start bouncing backwards and forwards, it's, it's not an ideal thing. Your common sense tells you what you want to do is be keeping a, a straight line in the middle of the lane. Well, that's what lane following assist does. They talk about the um, radar um, sensors that are there detecting the white lines and specifically trying to keep you in the middle of the lane, not necessarily crossing. So I'm not sure how the two things can work in conjunction with each other, because if you've got lane following assist on, then you shouldn't ever get to the outside lanes for lane keep assist to bring you back across. So how the two integrate as two separate pieces of technology, I can't quite understand. It's almost to me as if lane keep assist gets lane keep assist plus for the following. Um, and hence it keeps you in the middle. But the, the, the following is the, is the key item um, because not only is it keeping you in the centre of the uh, lanes, it's handling the distance to the cars in front and your speed, and it works at different speeds. Lane keep assist only works uh, between two certain speeds. I, I'm not sure what it is, I'll, I'll put it up here. It's something like 30 to 100 kilometres an hour it works at. And lane following assist works all the way from 0 to 150 kilometers an hour. So that alone tells us that it's intended to be used in start-stop traffic. Traffic that's going to come to a stop and start again. And this is where I see its key use will be. That in a queue of traffic it will follow the traffic and keep in the lane. So it's a combination of I wouldn't say cruise control with the advanced features but it's using the same features for detecting the traffic ahead and keeping up with the traffic. And that sounds like a really useful feature. It does sound like it's um, a change from lane keep assist more as avoiding an accident by adjusting you back in the lane. It seems as like lane following assist is going to be definitely more towards autonomous driving so that it's going to give you a more relaxing drive in those situations where you need to stop and start and follow traffic and keep in the lane. So my interpretation is to think of it as an advanced lane keep assist but its purpose is definitely to not just save an accident, but also to um, add as a driver aid to make your drive more relaxing. And that's, that's definitely a step towards autonomous driving. The feature? Well, the feature was released, I think, in February this year for the Hyundai Nexo. So the Kona Electric is going to get some of the uh, electronic features and technologies that were developed for the Nexo. And what a, gr what a great thing that, uh, you know, here's us worrying about the cost of this Kona Electric and you know, the more you find that the car has and can do, the more perhaps it's worth the money. Now for me, lane following assist, I don't think that's going to be of much use at all um, because most of the roads around here don't have white lines on them at all. So keeping in the lane and following traffic seems, seems unnecessary. I'd probably want to be able to turn it on and off quite, quite easily. But when I'm on longer distance journeys and uh, I'm on dual carriageways, A roads, motorways and the start-stop traffic, yeah, I could, I could see lane following assist being very, very useful and making your drive more relaxing. Um, there's lots of positives towards it with autonomy, 
But what about, what about the negatives? Well, it's just the principle of what it's doing. It's encouraging you to not do the driving, to not touch the steering wheel. Now, I know its intention is to assist you in doing that, but as I said, it's encouraging you through its ability to do less. So it's going to encourage some people to make phone calls, some people to have that cup of coffee that sat in, uh, in the cup holder beside them. It's going to encourage people to do things that you wouldn't normally because the car's capable of driving itself. So that what we're getting towards is the argument of is autonomous driving a good thing or a bad thing? And in good use of the technology, it's a very good thing. In excessive use of the technology, I think we're going to be seeing some uh, videos on YouTube of cars braking when they perhaps shouldn't do and people rear-ending them. Um, you're going to see cars taking avoiding action uh, when you wouldn't expect it. And uh, what about people being confused? Well, here's where I think it's going to affect me personally, um, us personally, and other people like myself, where I'm the regular driver. I drive most of the time, and Susan drives uh, when she's doing something separately or when she feels like it. But I, I do most of the driving. What happens when I've done all the testing, I know how the features work, I know how the car's set up, and I know what to expect <coughs> with these features for following other cars, the cruise control, the keeping in the lanes, whether the car's going to help you or whether it's not, warning alarms, telling you to put your hand on the steering wheel, if of course that's what it does. Um, all of those things, whereas Susan jumps in the car, she won't have read the manual, she, she won't have tested those features. Uh, if the car starts doing something um, that she's not expecting, I wonder how she'll react. Autonomous driving? Where do, where do I stand on that? I am very pro-autonomous driving. I think it is the future and once we get to a stage where it's made law that you have to have certain features in the car such as the anti-collision avoidance systems and those sort of things then you're onto the stage of well, if everyone's got the technology you can interconnect the technology because having one car that can see what's happening around it and interact with it sorry not interact with it that can avoid things with it is one thing but to have multiple vehicles communicating with each other and becoming aware of each other both electronically as well as visually that double check will really really help and so when you're on a dual carriageway and you've got a slip road coming out i mean what, what a nightmare that situation is because half the drivers on the road think that the person joining the dual carriageway, the motorway, have right of way and you have to give way to them. So they always indicate and pull out into an outside lane and let this traffic come through, only to find someone in the outside lane coming really fast has to brake hard because they didn't see them. Um, if everyone understood the rules of the road and knew that uh, the people joining the road have to wait and have to join safely, then everyone would keep a continuous speed and there'd be no swerving, no avoiding, no pulling out. And those movements of cars and changes of direction of cars, that's what causes accidents. So with autonomous driving, my belief is once the features are there and become more advanced and once they interconnect, solving that issue of merging traffic in amongst itself uh, safely and automatically, that will be, for me, um, the huge feature. The, and the amount of accidents that will be saved will be huge. I don't know whether other countries and other counties have this issue, but I've noticed in Norfolk where you have a cycleway on the pedestrian footpath, um, they don't have the white line on the inside edge of the road. So you have the road, then you have a raised curb, and then you have the white line further in, denoting the edge of the lane for the cyclists. So if your car is happy for you to bounce up to the white line in Norfolk, it's going to actually mount the curb and <laughs> go to that white line. So we've, we've got issues, haven't we, with autonomous driving that unless there are standards and unless the councils paint the white lines in a way that takes into account the technology, then we're not going to have safe roads um, because the some cars will work in that scenario and some won't. So for me, the, there are some dangers in using autonomous driving if it's not integrated. And this is down to our government, isn't it? And so far what I can see is extremely poor. It's not getting involved in autonomous driving. There you go. Uh, we've got a new feature coming, lane following assist. And it is not the same as lane keep assist. So I just want to share that with you. 
Thank you for watching everyone and uh, really appreciate all those that are subscribing. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Uh, hopefully there'll be some news in the coming weeks about the uh, Kona Electric in the UK. Can't wait for that. See you again soon. Bye.